Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking the time to be with us today on the webinar. This webinar is being brought to you by UC Irvine Extension. Uh, and today's topic is optical systems. Uh, it's not just about the optics. Uh, we are, just before we get going, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of how the webinar works. Uh, we do have the audio lines on mute, so uh, you want to use the chat area in the right side middle of the screen uh, for questions. Also, you can use the Q&A area in the bottom right side of the screen. We'll be monitoring both of those for any questions along the way, and please feel free to ask any questions that come up. Uh, we also have UCI Eric on the line. If there's any other technical issues uh, with audio, you can chat using that chat session, and you can see uh, Eric just posted a, uh, a note in there. So use that little chat session and chat directly with Keith if there's any, I'm sorry, <laughs> with Eric if there's any questions at all regarding uh, any, any technical issues you might be having with uh, the webinar today. We're very fortunate to have Keith Kazunik with us. Uh, Keith has had a tremendous amount of experience over 25 years in both developing optical and op electro-optical uh, systems, uh, including infrared and laser systems. Uh, he has a, a textbook. He's an author of an optical systems engineering undergraduate book. He's both an uh, adjunct professor at uh, the University of Central Florida and at Georgia Tech, along with being an instructor uh, for us here at UC Irvine. Uh, and he's currently the uh, optical systems, uh, or the technical director for uh, optical systems. Uh, we're really fortunate to have you with us here, Keith. Thanks for your, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, David, real appreciate that. Thank you, and thanks to everyone for uh, <clears throat> listening in this morning. So, as they mentioned, we have a webinar on optical system engineering, and the idea here is that perhaps we've taken a lot of courses over the years, or perhaps we're just getting going in the UC Irvine Extension system where we've taken one or two courses in lens design. And what this course is emphasizing is the fact that it's not just the lens design, that there's a number of other issues involved with getting optical system to work properly. And so, for example, then we have the next slide where we say, ah, okay, we have other issues involved. For example, radiometry. We have optical sources. We have detectors and focal plane arrays. We have optomechanics. Those are the four broad topic areas I'll be covering in the course. And that course, of course, is starting in the fall in about five or six weeks. And when I do say here in my slide, we're emphasizing first order system level estimates. What I'm saying there, we're essentially going to be working with spreadsheets and the back of the envelope calculations uh, rather than, say, VMAX code, which would be more appropriate for a lens design type of course. So it's kind of a way to motivate the <clears throat> content of the course. Then I added four little questions that we are going to be working through this half this morning. And the first one, which is a radiometry question, why is it that F number is not a complete description of the radiometry of an optical system? Second one is an optical source question, why a more powerful source may not necessarily be brighter? And then automatically, of course, we're seeing then the connection between radiometry and optical sources. We're starting to see how we integrate these topics into developing a complete optical system. Extremely important is the third question, then, where we're looking at detectors and focal plane arrays. And we say, why is it that a larger aperture despite the better optical resolution, might result in worse image quality. We're all used to thinking in terms of a larger aperture giving us a smaller blur size and therefore better optical resolution, and that's certainly always the case, but it may result in worse system resolution when you start including the focal plane array in the system. And then finally, we look at the issues involved with optomechanics, and that is to say uh, a ZMAX optimized lens design may not be manufacturable because ZMAX doesn't know too much about manufacturability, uh, nor might it be usable in a real-world thermal and vibration environments, because ZMAX doesn't know anything about those environments either, and it's up to us as an optical system engineer to bring those topics uh, onto the table. Okay, so just briefly then, what is it that we need by optical systems, everything that people are familiar with, going to be telescopes, microscopes, cameras, binoculars, et cetera. Lasers, of course, are a source, but also a system. And then I've got here a quote from a gentleman of JPL who wrote a really excellent paper back in 2005 where the 
idea of the optical design and engineering lessons learned is brought out, and he basically states, experience suggests that the optical engineer who can understand systems trades and can design an overall balanced instrument will in general be more sought after than the lens designer who does not extend beyond the narrow confines of the trade. So, so here we have a strong motivation for a course in optical systems engineering. Someone with the skills in optical systems engineering will be more sought after than the, than the lens designer who hasn't looked at the more general issues. So next chart then we simply say, okay, just so we're all on the same page, what do we mean by optical? And optical is of course an electromagnetic wave. And here I'm going to be assuming on the order of a one micron wavelength. And yes, we'll go down to maybe a tenth of that to get a tenth of a micron for ultraviolet. And yes, we'll go out to maybe 10 times that for 10 microns for infrared. And we'll be covering both ultraviolet and infrared. This is not purely an infrared course or a visible course. We'll be covering both topics. And that just gives us in some background as far as commonality and what page we're all starting from. Next page then says we have some content that we're going to need to cover in the course over the semester. And the content is broken down into seven sections. First section, we'll be reviewing some basic concepts of systems engineering and some tools that system engineers typically use. Most important are the content of optical engineering and how it applies to developing an optical system. And that content was going to be basically reviewed in two sections, geometrical optics and aberrations in image quality, which I'm going to assume people have more or less a decent background in. But we'll go ahead and do spend one week reviewing both of those topics anyway. And the core of the course starts then with radiometry. We'll be spending a couple weeks on that, two weeks on optical sources, three weeks on detectors and focal plane arrays, and then we'll be closing up with a week on optomechanical design. Next chart just shows a little bit about optical system engineering in general. So one of the first things we notice, this is kind of a busy chart, but one of the first things we notice <clears throat> looking on the upper left are three boxes called optical, mechanical, electrical. So there it is right away. Putting together an optical system, it's not just the optics. It's the optical engineer, it's the mechanical engineer, it's the electrical engineer. We have optomechanics, we have optoelectronics, and we have systems engineering t issues to concern ourselves with also. Let's start then with some of the content that I <clears throat> excuse me, mentioned in the four questions we'll be looking at. The first question is a, a radiometric question. And we're going through these questions just to give you a feeling for <clears throat> the kind of content I'll be covering over the semester. So the first question then is a radiometry one, since we're starting out essentially with radiometry in the course. And we have two pictures in the bottom of that chart. And one is a camera with a certain field of view. And then to the right of that is another camera with a, a field of view that's about twice the size. And now the cameras have the same aperture size and they have the same focal length. So therefore they have the same F number. And we might ask ourselves, well, they have the same F number. So if we're used to thinking of F number as a primary metric for collection of radiometry, of collection of photons, collection of light, we might say to ourselves, which of these is going to collect more light? And we might answer, well, both are going to collect the same amount of light. And that answer is not correct. Okay, it turns out that the system shown on the right, the camera shown on the right, with a larger field of view will collect more light. And we can think of that in terms of, well, if I've got a bigger field, then I might have, say, more bright sources in that field. And so if I'm collecting light from more bright sources, let's say I have two bright light bulbs in the left-hand camera and four bright light bulbs in the right-hand camera, then I'm going to be collecting more light. And I need a bigger focal plane array to do that, but I'm still going to be collecting more light with the sensor on the right because it has a larger field of view. Okay, and the way we describe that radiometrically is with a concept called Aton Du. And so if we look at how much power the focal plane collects, we have an equation on the upper right-hand side where flux is the power in watts. And that's going to depend on four quantities. And the first is the transmission of the optical system. That's fairly well known. And we won't spend too much time reviewing that in the course, but we will spend a little bit of time on how that can be affected. 
So the second term is the radiance of the source. And we're going to assume that the radiance of the source is the same in both those scenarios. Third, we have what's called the entrance pupil area. And that's basically the size of the aperture that's collecting the light in the third. And then is the solid angle associated with the field of view. So as we just went through intuitively, if we have a larger entrance pupil aperture, therefore a larger area and a larger field of view, we're going to end up with more photons on the focal plane. More watts will be collecting by that optical system collected on the focal plane. Now, it, it turns out that if we look at what A ton do in terms of the A omega product is, and we see that, oh, but if we need a wider field of view, we need a bigger focal plane, and perhaps we can also do the same thing by shortening up the focal length, and then it turns out, and the algebra is really quite straightforward, but the H on do is also equal to, as we'll see in the bottom equation on the bottom right, also equal to the solid angle associated with the F number of optics times the detector area. Okay, so right there we see very clearly that the amount of power that we collect on a focal plane array depends not just on the F number. It depends also on the area of the detector, and there's some interesting and very useful trades that come out of that, and really one of the essential parts of all systems engineering in general and optical systems engineering in particular are the trades that come out of being able to say, oh, but maybe I don't need such a fast net number. I can make up my power collection with a bigger detector instead. Okay, so that was that first question then. Second question then was about <clears throat> optical sources, and the idea was then that I said, well, you know, a <clears throat> more powerful source may not necessarily be brighter. And so we've got two pictures on the right-hand side there. One is a 600-watt tungsten halogen lamp. And these are Newport Corporation parts that I use to actually do the examples in class during the semester. Right now, we don't have time for that. Uh, I compare it with a 1,000-watt tungsten halogen lamp. And you might say, well, gee, you know, the 1,000-watt lamp is going to be brighter, isn't it? Well, it turns out not. It turns out the 1,000-watt lamp, of course, has more power, right? It has 400 watts more power, but power is not the same as brightness. So let's go through that very quickly. Brightness tells us how much power is coming from a source of a certain size and into a certain solid angle. So we see the two different pictures on the top that we have that the 600 watt filament is emitting into a certain solid angle, I'm calling it omega-1. And the bigger filament on the bottom, the 1,000 watt lamp, is emitting into a larger solid angle. So I essentially created a collimator with these two lamps, and the collimation elimination angle is larger for the bigger lamp. So if I look at the brightness of this collimator, I say, well, the brightness depends on the area of the lens that's doing the collimating, and it also depends on the solid angle I'm emitting into. So the more powerful lamp has more power, but it's emitting into a brighter solid angle. So by the definition of collimator brightness, I have more power, but I've got a bigger solid angle. And so it turns out that that ratio stays exactly the same for those two different lamps. And therefore, the brightness for two different tungsten halogen lamps is the same. And that's inherent in the physics of tungsten halogen. I could have looked at those uh, filaments themselves and come to the same conclusion without even making a collimator. If I just look at the 600 watt filament and I compare that with a 1,000 watt filament, I will have exactly the same brightness. And that's inherent in the physics of how to generate photons from a piece of coiled tungsten. Now, if I instead use something called an arc lamp, which inherently is able to generate more watts or the same watts from a smaller area, now I have a, a brighter source. In that case, my brighter source would, in fact, be due to having the fact that I have more power, but also from a smaller area. So we'll be going through that in, in detail. We have two weeks to spend on optical sources. The third topic I'm spending three weeks on, extremely important, and it's motivated by the fact that a focal plane array for measuring an image, for collecting an image, is going to do what's called sample the field. And that is to say, if you look at, say, for example, the, the French pointless painters back in the late 1800s, they were sampling a field. They weren't broad stroking. They weren't brush stroking. They were basically creating a, 
a scene based on dots, and the dots, the points, were their interpretation of each point in the scene of the, of the object they were trying to paint. And so a focal plane array does the same thing. It doesn't use dots. It uses square pixels. But it does the same concept. And the spatial frequency, that is the sampling frequency, depends not on the painter's ability to point dots very closely, but it depends on the, how closely the pixels are spaced together. Okay, so this is an extremely important concept because it turns out that the image quality of your optical system is going to depend not now just on the optics, but it's also going to depend on the focal plane array, and it's going to depend on how those two play together. And in particular, you can look at something called Q, and that's defined by the ratio of the optical blur to the pixel pitch, right? how far the pixels are spaced apart. So the blur might be 10 microns, and the pixels might be spaced, say, 2 microns. And so the blur is 5 microns divided by 2 microns divided by another factor of 2.44. And that comes out of the fact that the blur is defined on the right-hand side of this chart as, of course, the usual expression that we're all familiar with of 2.44 times the wavelength times the F number. Okay, so we can see that the scale of something called Q is equal to 2 is dominated by the optical blur. That is, that's the biggest scale when you're comparing the optical blur with the detector blur versus something called a Q is equal to 0 0.2, one-tenth the Q, where the optical blur is now smaller than the pixel spacing and the pixel size itself, which are pretty much the same under certain conditions. Okay, so what's that mean? What that means is, is that if you start having, say, samples in your field determined by the pixel spacing, but the optical blur fills in, say, five points in your field, then I'm not going to be doing any better than, say, the pixel spacing. And the blur from the optics now starts becoming less and less relevant. So essentially what happens is the very fine, say, line spacing that you might see on the object now becomes what is called aliased. That is to say, the high spatial frequencies in a very closely spaced set of lines becomes aliased. That is to say, it looks like the close spacings are now have a, a much lower spatial frequency. And that can be seen on the picture to the right comparing with the picture on the left, where the fine spatial resolution in the picture on the left gets lost as you start going to a finer and finer telescope blur, that is a bigger aperture. Right, so in this particular case, the bigger aperture gives worse image quality. Right? The image quality on the right is not nearly as good as the image quality on the, on the picture on the left, and that's because it has a bigger aperture, and, and therefore the blur in comparison with the pixel size is not nearly as good. We have aliasing. The aliasing reduces the image quality. Okay, and if you're used to the modulation transfer function method of measuring image quality, and then we can take a look at some charts that explain that also. And what this clearly spells out is how the system MTF depends on the detector MTF and the optical MTF combined. So in the top plot, we see how the detector MTF varies as a function of spatial frequency. And I have two detector pitches, one 10 micron and the other 20 micron. And what this shows is that clearly the smaller pixel pitch can resolve higher spatial frequencies, no surprise there. On the bottom chart, then, we start throwing in both the detector and the optical MTF at the same time. And I plot out separately the optical MTF with its cutoff at 100 line pairs per millimeter, but just as an example. And the detector MTF, I'm using a 20 micron pitch, and its cutoff is 50 line pairs per millimeter, for example. And what we see is when we take that product, that the total system MTF is really dominated by the detector now. Okay, and this is not even showing what happens when you have aliasing. And I'll go through in the course under what conditions aliasing happens, the idea of Nyquist frequency, and when the optical MTF exceeds the Nyquist frequency when aliasing occurs. And so we'll go through that in the course. For now, I just wanted to show that we 
have a situation here where I can have an optical MTF that gets much better, let's say a much larger aperture, let's say twice the aperture, driving the spatial frequency of the optical cutoff out to say twice what it is, 200 line pairs per millimeter, but the overall net on, on the system MTF is trivial, is non-existent. So we see what can, in that case, have no effect on the MTF, and that excludes the idea of aliasing. When we include aliasing, we'll see we have negative effects on the MTF. So we'll have worse image quality with bigger apertures. So final topic then for the semester is going to be just a brief review of optomechanical design. I may also be teaching a course in the winter or spring semester, uh, an entire semester course on optical design, optomechanical design. So this semester we'll just be doing one brief summary, one, uh, one overview basically. And what that's basically saying is that I can have a very, very effective optical design shown in the top diagram. And it's been optimized by the lens designer to look like it does. But now we have to throw it into a housing. We have to worry about fabricating the lenses themselves, and there's going to be fabrication errors associated with that. There's going to be misalignments between the lenses as they're assembled. There's going to be strain induced on the lenses as the lenses are put into their housing. There's going to be temperature-induced wavefront errors that will happen as the temperature of the assembly changes. Right? So it might work great at room temperature or in your lab, but it, moving it out to the field where temperatures might drop below freezing or, say, out in Tucson where they get, up below, uh, get over uh, uh, 30 degrees C regularly, 110 or so regularly, not a problem. Uh, then we can have temperature-induced wavefront errors. So we see that the Optomechanical design is actually a huge, huge determinant of whether or not your optical system is going to work properly or not. The lens design itself is maybe 20% of the problem. In the optomechanical design, when you include fabrication tolerances, alignment tolerances, thermal effects such as thermal expansion and change in index with temperature, structural misalignments is about 80% of the problem in determining whether or not your system will actually work properly. Okay, so let's summarize then. Why is it that F number is not a complete description of the radiometry of an optical system? Let's go through these questions that we asked at the beginning of the, of the webinar as a way of summarizing what the course will be about. Okay, and the answer to the first question is a ton do. Both pixel size and F number determine how much power is collected by the optical system. It's not just the optics. Why is a more powerful source not necessarily brighter? And that would be because the more powerful source if I'm putting it into a collimator, it's going to be emitting into a larger solid angle. Or if I just look at the source itself, it's going to be bigger if it's the same type of source. And because it's bigger, it's going to be emitting from a large area. And so therefore, its brightness is going to be any better. If I need brighter source, I need to go to a, a different physics-based source, such as, say, a, an arc lamp rather than a tungsten halogen. Third question we looked at, why might a larger aperture, despite its better optical resolution, result in worse op image quality? And the answer is because the image quality depends on two factors at least. There are others involved that I haven't talked about, but at least it depends on more than just the optics. It also depends on the detector, in particular the blur to pixel ratio of the detector. And you can end up with aliasing, that is these jaggies that you saw in that picture when your larger aperture starts giving you a smaller blur size. And we'll go through in, in detail on that. And also the fourth question we then looked at was why might an optimized lens design might not be manufacturable nor usable in real world thermal and vibration environments. And that again is related to the fact we have fabrication tolerances, we have alignment tolerances, we have thermal expansions, we have changes of the refractive index with temperature that is to say DNDT, we have structural loads and so on. We'll be going through a fairly high level review of these effects in only one, in only one class this semester. But if you'd like to learn more, uh, please sign up for the course. And the course is called Optical System Engineering. It is based on my textbook of the same name. Uh, the course number is WCS X496. And I'm asking as a prerequisite or a co-requisite intro to lens design 493. And you can see it's basically because we have some MTF issues that we'll be looking at 
and without a good understanding of MCF, uh, it will be difficult to follow what's happening. So I thank you for your time. I think Dave wants to add in some more information on some of the background of the other parts of the program. You bet. Thanks, Keith. And uh, what we'll do is just, uh, again, I, just so you know who else is on the call here, my name is Dave Demas, and I'm the Director of Engineering and Sciences here at UC Irvine. We also have on the call uh, Jennifer Spitzer. Uh, if any of you guys, and, and we've got a couple questions already about, you know, things like jobs and other things, sounds like we've got some different people. And Keith, if you can stay on just for a second, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll answer a couple of those. If there are other questions about uh, optics program, uh, optical system design, uh, and, and anything, uh, jobs, careers, anything, we're, we're, we're certainly here to help. And, and again, uh, Jennifer and I both are, are fairly well plugged into the, the optics community. Uh, we have an advisory board that is well plugged in. We've got excellent faculty like uh, uh, Keith. And uh, we can help. We talk to a lot of people about, you know, careers, where they're moving, uh, whether they're in optics already or not, or whether they're moving into it um, or, or like to move into it. A lot of people come out with generic, uh, maybe an engineering degree, mechanical, but the jobs, um, you know, need, need some more optics. And that's why we put this program together, because the industry was telling us that, that bachelor's degree was just not quite enough. And yet a lot of people don't want to go for law on to get their master's. So let me just show you real quick what – this is some overview of what the systems is. There's really two programs here, optical engineering and optical instrument design are the two programs. Uh, they are very related, uh, and these courses are, are part of the University of California. We are on the quarter system. So uh, our next quarter will begin September 24th. Oh, I got a big thick line there. Sorry, guys. Uh, let me change that thickness. Uh, and uh, that all these courses that uh, will be offered in this program are uh, going to be online. So it's very easy to uh, look at these programs and uh, take these programs uh, if you're working. Uh, obviously, if you've got another job. What we do, what the course looks like, just so you know, so you know what the live online course looks like, uh, it means that there are some sessions where it's a physical webinar like what we're doing right now, but then there are other sessions that are recorded that you can listen to anytime you want during the week. And uh, that makes it much more easy to move around your busy schedules. Uh, we see most of our students doing work uh, in the evenings and on the weekends, sometimes uh, at lunch. But you're still doing the same amount of work. You're doing everything you'd normally do if the class was meeting live. Uh, the discussions are actually even better because they're uh, asynchronous, but they happen all throughout the week. So all the questions that come up, when you have a question about something and you're in the middle of something, you post that up to the discussion forum, and then hopefully later on, maybe that evening, the instructor looks at it and gives you back an answer. So that activity is actually quite, quite, better, quite a bit better than it uh, would occur in a live class. Uh, because often students are a little uncomfortable maybe asking some questions where in online uh, students ask lots and lots of questions. It's actually much better. And again, the two programs, uh, there's optical engineering uh, and optical instrument design. Uh, both of them are uh, 15 units of required courses. And again, they're designed for people that are working. So uh, typically people take a single course at a time. If somebody is in between jobs, uh, then you could possibly take more. And by the way, if you are in between jobs, uh, there's a lot of great programs, federal programs that will pay for all this. If you haven't already checked into things like the work, checked into things like the Workforce Investment Act, uh, let us know, and we can help you with uh, that kind of funding as well. Veterans also have some really good funding. Uh, and uh, students have some opportunity uh, to do some service to get some funding too through things like AmeriCorps. Just to give you an idea, the optical engineering courses uh, that are coming up, the one that Keith just talked about is the optical systems engineering. And uh, there's also, if, if you're just starting out and you want to go back into the intro to lens, uh, that course is also being offered in the fall. Those two yellow ones are the fall offerings. And then the other two, advanced lens and optical systems uh, that Keith also mentioned he may be teaching in, in the subsequent quarters uh, are part of the required units for optical engineering. And for optical instruments, slightly different for required classes, uh, the optical mechanical component and then on optical instrument design specific, uh, obviously, for optical instrument certificate. 
Then the elective courses that we've got listed here, and, and my big thick arrow, sorry, it's still thick, uh, yeah, are the same for both programs. So these electives, uh, regardless of which program you're coming into, uh, work for either one. And that's uh, the geometric and physical. And a lot of times if you're new, uh, geometric and physical are a good place to start. Uh, uh, that's a, a really good place to kind of jump in. And then there's a bunch of other electives that are meant for those people that are really trying to go in a specific direction with their career. You know, maybe they are, you know, going in the fiber optic direction, uh, a lot of big growth in that direction in industry, a lot of job availability there, especially in, in, in lighting, in commercial and residential lighting to get the power consumption down. Uh, and then metrology and informometry, introduction to solid works and, and position control and vibration control round out the electives in this particular program. Uh, so with that, you know, we've got uh, a couple questions that I want to get to. Please feel free to, you know, post any other questions. Uh, but just want to remind everybody that this little webinar has been uh, recorded uh, and you will get a link back to this recording if there's anything you missed or names phone numbers, contact information, that kind of stuff. Uh, but it looks like Keith, and Keith, are you still with us? Is your cell phone, are your battery still good? So far, so good. It's still saying low battery, but it's not dumping me out, so. We had a couple questions, but they were a little bit more kind of job related. Uh, and this was, uh, uh, it sounds like an, an undergraduate that is looking uh, to, to possibly get into optics and uh, wanted just sort of a characterization of, you know, what's, what's it like getting, getting started and is this a, a good play for me uh, to try to help me get a job if I, if I get a little more optic specific uh, skill set. Uh, your thoughts, Keith, I mean, you're in the industry, you've hired people. Yeah, absolutely. The optical engineering degree and in general and the optical engineering certificate from UCI are invaluable. Uh, optical engineering in general is not a well-stocked engineering discipline, right? There are not many programs who are training people. Uh, UCI is very unique, of course, there's University of Arizona and there's University of Rochester and there's Creole, uh, and that's it, right? So the supply of optical engineers is very limited, and an entry-level engineer at this point in optical engineering is going to be highly regarded, no doubt in my mind. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you're here, uh, we're, we're down here, obviously, in the Orange County area. A lot of you guys are from uh, other places in, you know, throughout the U.S. But uh, just speaking from the local economy here, there's, there's a strong growth in, in the medical product areas. And, and there's a tremendous amount of the medical products uh, that rely quite a bit on, on optics. Um, and, uh, you know, oftentimes they're very small optics, but they're yet still the same issues. Uh, yeah, and very good point. Um, when I was teaching up at SPIE uh, Photonics West in January of this year, I, I basically teach a one-day short course on the optical system engineering up there, and two-thirds of the attendees were from uh, bio-optics type background, biomedical background, and from the Bay Area alone, right? So there's a huge number of employers out there who are doing biomedical. Uh, obviously, I think the say defense has perhaps dropped a little bit, but the biomedical is picking it up. So in general, uh, at the very least, you have the same amount of demand this year that you had last year. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he's right. You know, there, there's a lot, there's biomed in a lot of places. Um, and certainly some of the hotspots are, uh, you know, the, the San Francisco Bay Area and uh, San Diego, LA, Orange County. Uh, but there are some hot spots on the East Coast and other places in the U.S. as well. So, you know, check around, you know, you guys do your own searches, you know, p pick out some of the words optic, optical engineering, stick it on Monster or Indeed, and it'll give you a good sense of, of the demand there. Again, we never create any of these uh, certificate programs unless they're strong demand. I mean, the people, the, the industry comes to us and says, again, that these, they're not finding enough uh, people. They're having to spend a lot of time training, uh, and they'd rather people came in with a, a little bit more uh, optics-specific uh, background. And especially in today's tighter job market, uh, you know, the more general uh, undergraduate engineering degrees and ICS and physics degrees, uh, it, it's a little harder to, to find jobs now. So adding a, 
a couple uh, classes or potentially a full certificate. And that was another question that came up is, you know, do I have to commit to taking this entire certificate? And, and certainly the answer is no. These are, these are courses that we offer to try to help people get jobs and to help the industry. Uh, you take what you need. If you choose to finish out the full 15 units, then we do indeed give a certificate. Uh, but even if you just take a couple classes, certainly you can add those to your resume uh, and people will see that not only are yeah, you investing in your career, but you are also, uh, you know, got very uh, specific job skills that are, that are very valuable. Another, another question was more along the lines of how do I get into this profession? Uh, it looks like maybe this person's already working as an engineer. And some of the things, and Keith, you can jump in here as well, but the things that we always suggest as far as getting in are, are, are using, uh, you know, networking, using the, the industry societies. Um, there, there's several uh, good industry societies. Keith has mentioned a few already. Uh, the Optical Society of Southern California is one, SBIE. Uh, and, but you want to get into uh, some of those meetings, go to some of the physical meetings, regardless of where you're located, you, you can find something, uh, and, and go to those meetings, meet people, talk to them, you know, sit down at dinner with them, talk to them about their career. You want to try to avoid, you know, directly asking for, oh, is there any openings at your company? You want to kind of get to know the people first and uh, talk to them about their career, how they got to where they're going, uh, kind of get to know them, and then, Use them uh, as a LinkedIn. Ask them if you can uh, be a, a you know a buddy on LinkedIn. And if you haven't used LinkedIn and you're you're networking for a new job, uh, then please get a LinkedIn account. It's kind of like Facebook, but it's uh, a place where you can uh, remember the people that you meet and also know a little bit about them. It's where you kind of essentially put up your your resume, uh, but it also helps you keep track of your professional contacts. And when you're in this kind of a mode of looking for or moving into a new industry, you know, those professional contacts in that new industry are incredibly valuable. So you meet that guy at the society meeting, and then two or three weeks later, you see maybe that his company's got a job opening. Well, then once you've got the relationship with him and you've kept track of him in LinkedIn, then you go back to him and say, hey, I, I see that you guys have an opening uh, could uh, could we have lunch and could you tell me a little bit about how it, what it's like to work at that your company and maybe a little bit about that particular job and then maybe at lunch you say well do you if you're interested then you ask the guy uh well could do you know anything about the hiring manager and if you're lucky enough that the guy does then you've got a tremendous uh, value and, and you're going to be much higher on the list of all these resumes that have come in because somebody within the organization knows you. Now, that doesn't always happen, but you want to try to increase your odds of having that happen by networking to as many people as possible. Uh, because a lot of these people, even though they may not work at the company, they might also know somebody else that works there. And again, incredibly valuable. Keith, uh, other, other industry societies or other places where uh, you might recommend people network? I think you've uh, really covered them all very nicely here, Dave. Uh, LinkedIn is, as you say, a kind of a professional Facebook. And in fact, LinkedIn is how I met Don Silverman, which is how we got this whole course started. Um, so that's an invaluable resource to start taking advantage of. It's, it's free, and there's no reason not to take advantage of that. Uh, but also a story uh, that goes along with what you're saying here. Uh, when I was doing optomechanical engineering, I wanted to start doing more optical work. And I said, well, gee, how can I start doing more optical work? And my manager told me, well, you need to take more courses in optics. So that's what I did. All right, so in that case, it was knowing the right person, that is my manager, but also then getting the training necessary to, for him to look at me and say, oh, yeah, you do know a little bit about lens design. You do know a little bit about geometrical optics. So. The bottom line, of course, being the best way to get into this industry then would be training, such as the courses that are being offered now by UCI and, and through the certificate program. And don't forget that the, even within the course itself, 
Yeah, the course itself is a, is a great networking opportunity. There's a lot of people in the course. Uh, many of them are already in the industry. You have little offline chats. We have these little uh, kind of coffee house chat rooms that are meant to, for that kind of activity because there's a lot of value in that, and we recognize that value on both sides because people end up getting hired out of our classes from other people in the class or sometimes via the instructor. The instructor is also a very good networking opportunity. So uh, don't forget that little piece as well as the academics on top of this as well. A couple other questions that have come in on uh, you know, what kind of a, a workload, uh, how many hours, and all that kind of stuff. And typically, you know, these are like any other college class. Uh, they are focused a little bit more on the practical side, a little bit less on the theory. Uh, but they're uh, just like any other class. So typically, there's going to be, you know, for a you know, two or three unit class, there's going to be two to three hours of lecture per week. Now, whether that's a recorded lecture or uh, a live webinar like this, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It'll, it'll take up a, a few hours per week. But then there'll also be time uh, on the discussion boards where you're talking about the content that occurred that week that you were to listen to. And that will also probably add another hour or so, maybe 45 minutes, where the instructor will be prompting you to say, okay, we talked about this this week. Uh, give me your ideas in a paragraph or two, and you know, it might take you a little bit. And then he'll also ask you to interact and talk with himself and other students during that week. So again, that might be another 45 minutes or an hour. And then probably some reading. And if you add all that up, some homework, a few calculations, if you add all that up, probably anywhere from three to five hours. But the nice thing is, you know, it's pretty flexible. You know, you can, you can do it in the evenings. We, again, we see a lot of students doing stuff you know, later on at night, uh, I guess if the kids go to bed or something between 10 and 12 o'clock at night, uh, we see a lot of activity on the weekends. Uh, so people are, you know, a lot of these people are working adults, so, uh, you know, they've got to do this stuff. Uh, and we also see a lot of the discussion stuff happening at, during lunch because somebody thinks about them something and then pops over to the discussion board at lunch and uh, puts uh, his thoughts in and, and responds. So there's a lot of good continuity during the week. So it's in that range. Sometimes it could be a little less. Sometimes it can be a little more if there's a, possibly a project to. And just to remind you, that, again, these are 10-week uh, quarter system uh, at the University of California. Uh, so all courses are, are 10 weeks or less. Some of the courses are actually uh, a little bit shorter because the number of units is a little bit shorter. Uh, okay, let me see if there's anything else. If there's any other questions, uh, post them. Uh, other than that, uh, the only other question that came up is, uh, uh, I'm not sure if I want to go back and get a master's degree or a PhD yet, uh, but I want to try to figure this out maybe first. I'm not really sure. Can you help? Uh, Keith, you went through this, and, and you'll have to refresh my memory. Uh, did you go straight through, or did you work uh, after your master's and, and before you went back to Arizona? Yeah, I actually worked for about 10 years in industry as an optical mechanical engineer before going back to University of Arizona. And so I had quite a bit of time in industry. I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I got back to school. Um, but I think the general answer to the question might be one of, well, if you're not sure, the certificate that UCI is offering is really a great way to help you figure that out. Right? So you don't make the big commitment of moving to Arizona or moving to Orlando to go into a master's degree full time, you can take a course a quarter or, or even you know, a course a year and help you decide is this material interesting to you or not and if so, which direction might you want to go. Yeah, and that's great, Keith. And that's exactly what I was said is that you know you really want to do that. And I, I did a similar thing by the way with my PhD. I, I, I worked for a while. Uh, I did go through with a master's, but it, my master's was also fairly generic. Uh, so, you know, getting out into industry and then finding, you know, a, an area that uh, really resonated with kind of what I wanted to do and, honestly, the job market at the time, uh, you know, gave me, you know, a few years of, you know, figuring out and giving me that kind of on-the-job on, on uh, career counseling, essentially. And then when I came back uh, to, to do the Ph.D., and, and my company funded it, by the way, which made it, you know, best of both worlds, so I didn't have to... Uh, <laughs> 
you know, I could still support the family a little bit, and you know, and that that's you know, obviously an issue for a lot of people. Um, so, um, you know, we, we've been through that. So, again, if you guys have these kinds of questions, I know they come up all the time, and we get a lot of this kind of stuff uh, because it's often the people that come into the webinars. Uh, please, uh, you know, scroll back uh, on, on this uh, uh, recorded version that you'll get the link to in a minute uh, and, and talk to either Jennifer or myself. Uh, we, we, we've done this a lot. And we'd be happy to uh, do uh, more of one-on-one -on -one kind of career counseling, a little bit easier than uh, kind of doing it here in the, in the public setting. Uh, well, with that, I don't see any other questions on the board. Uh, Keith, I want to say thank you very much for everything you've done, the course, the webinar, uh, future courses, uh, just participating with uh, us. Uh, it's, it's great to have you on this team, uh, making this program even stronger. Uh, well, thank and you, I'd like to say you're absolutely welcome, and, and thank you for, for being uh, with us. And thank you to all of you for taking the time out of, out of your lunch, for most of you, uh, to be with us. And with that, I'm just going to say uh, good afternoon, everybody. Have a great afternoon, and thanks again one more time, Keith. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys.